continue to um, get this recording started and put, uh, put me up on Facebook. We got a Facebook Live going on too, huh? Yeah, um, I've been experimenting with that. And I'm just going to put it on my channel right now. I've had it on the other channels, but last time I did it, somebody asked me why. Okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let me shut that down and make sure I'm working properly here. You're the expert now. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Don't mess it up, there, Vern. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It looks like I'm the box. You're the expert tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, we are ready to get started here. I'm going to go ahead and turn my screen so we can get to these beginning slides. And can everybody see my screen right now? Yep. All right. Well, uh, welcome to the Denver Association of Assisted Living Residences. And this is probably our 52nd meeting that we've done. So we've done this for some time and uh, it keeps growing. We've got a, a great group here from across the nation. Right now we've got 46 participants. And uh, so it's almost as good as we had when we were live. We, we've gotten up to about 50 uh, in, in those meetings. And now we're starting to grow this. And what's kind of really neat about what we have going on is that we're seeing more people come from across the nation so we're getting a lot of different perspective. So um, move on here. Uh, if you are in Colorado, then, well, there's a lot of information here, even if you're not in Colorado, just about assisted living. Our website is daalr.com. But particularly in Colorado here, there's some key links that we put together for the operators locally. Uh, and the first one would be the final draft of the new regulations. Uh, I do need to check this link and make sure that it is hooked up to the most recent ones because they just changed the regs uh, recently with a few more things. Um, but I do have my website guy here. I think he's here tonight. Uh, I don't see him on the screen, but my screen's been reduced because we have so many people. And he takes care of our site, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we also have the pay Facebook page, and we encourage everybody to join the Facebook page. This is a great way to exchange information. Uh, of course, you know all about social media. So, you know, if you have a question or if you're looking for something, then this is a good place to uh, post that and just see if somebody in the community can help you out with that particular item. Um, next, we want to thank everybody that was able to sign up on Meetup. Uh, it just gives us an idea of what to expect as far as attendance goes. And we also use this as a communication platform. And um, let me talk a little bit about our sponsors. So we are an, um, a group that uh, does encourage some sponsorship. So we, we have some spaces available. And the sponsors that we have up here right now, you can see the uh, the, each of the sponsors here, I'm going to go through these individually and talk a little bit about them. So we have the RAL National Association, and this is a, uh, a group um, sort of like us, but much, much bigger and a great resource. We happen to have uh, Brian Pinkowski here tonight, who is the president of the RALNA. Brian, would you like to say a word or two about the yeah. group? I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Vern. Yeah, I am the president of the National Association. And the first thing to note is that um, memberships are actually free for the National Association right now, uh, especially for those who are part of the Denver ALR group. Um, but if you just go to ralna.com, it is on the bottom of the screen, you'll see what's going on there. And we're expanding. Um, we're actually handing a lot of the uh, group home um, activities in general, not merely uh, the assisted living thing, although the assisted living thing leads because that has the most uh, uh, demand for answers. It's, a, it's an important and heartfelt business model that people such as yourselves are involved in. And so there's a lot of answers in that national association. There's also a face group 
a Facebook group associated with the National Association where people get to chit chat back and forth about all manner of questions associated with how do I do this? What happens if this and all that sort of thing. Thank you, Vern. You bet, Brian, thank you. Next, we have Anderson Legal Business and Tax Advisors. Uh, these guys are really good for helping you figure out your taxes and uh, entity setups. Um, they uh, actually have, have a, a nice plan too called their platinum program. It's a monthly fee, but you can, um, you get a lot of benefits from them. Uh, I use them myself for uh, a few things in uh, when we need attorneys. So um, particularly with the taxes, you know, they, they do a great job in helping you figure out some tax strategies and that's really where they excel and and uh, setting that up. Uh, next, we have the RAL Academy. So if you're new to assisted living, then this is a great resource for education and you can get to them. Uh, we have a link on the website that goes right to them. It's up here under RAL um, or ralacademy.com is their website. Uh, our website is set up by Assisted Living Marketing, Peter Brissett. Peter, are you still on the call here? I'm here. All right. Do you want to say a word or two about your your company? Yeah. Yeah, real quick. Um, we've been working with senior care communities, assisted living facilities, uh, a lot of residential homes for the last 10 plus years and uh, really dedicated to the industry. So if you need help in regards to marketing, uh, websites, um, online advertising, um, Getting more traffic to your Google My Business page, online reviews, all that. Um, that's a space we primarily um, work in there. And I'm not sure if any of my cohorts from the Colorado Assisted Living Association are on, but I put a link in the chat. We also have a fall conference coming up. We're working with a couple other groups on that. So it's um, called Collaboration and Aging. So I just want to make sure I mention that. Have I'll give you a moment uh, when we get to a slide on Cala to speak up for them. Peter, seeing how you, I, I was wondering if we had anybody else on. So you, you'll you get to speak twice. Peter does a great job with websites. I've had a few web guys throughout the years and Peter's been absolutely the most responsive person I've ever worked with. And it's, it's a real pleasure working with him. We've actually used him for um, not only our dollar website, but my wife has a business. We used him for her website. Um, and Peter's helping me work on my uh, my other business website. Um, so I, I highly recommend him. And Vern, this is Jana Cornell. I'm here. I'm with Cala. And hey, uh, Peter's like the awesome dude, you know. So <laughs> websites, so we're all happy. We run our website through him too. So I'll be happy to help out with the Cala um, information too. Terrific. I, I'm sorry I didn't see you, Janet. We've got 46 okay. people up here. We got, good, we got a good crowd tonight. We're excited about that. We, we do. Uh, next, uh, we have Pinkowski Law, and our speaker tonight is uh, Brian Pinkowski. And um, Brian, would you like to talk a little bit about your um, Pinkowski Law, or do you want to save it for your presentation? Oh, I'm happy to say a few things right now. Thank you, Vern. Yeah, so um, Michelle Pinkowski and I were married, and uh, we have a law firm together, and and we represent about a thousand beds in Colorado and significantly more than that around the United States. So uh, in Colorado, we represent from soup to nuts and from the very beginning of purchasing an assisted living to uh, working through the asset purchase agreement, through handling the state agency, through then the, on to the sale of it at the end of its uh, life cycle for if it's a business investment with that kind of of a life cycle. And nationally, we work with people to help increase, as well as in Colorado, we help people uh, work through citing, uh, locating where their assisted living should be. And we have some great blogs about how to do that, what you should do first. And it's not necessarily your real estate contract that you start with. And working out how many beds that you can negotiate with the city or the HOA or, or whatever. So we help people around the nation on just about all things associated with assisted living. As far as we can tell, we are pretty much the only assisted living specialty lawyers uh, around the United States, but uh, you know, there's obviously room for more. There's 40,000 members in the National Association of Smaller Assisted Living and, and 
you know, at least 400 or so in Colorado alone. So there's, there's room. Um, we do work sometimes with Anderson. They're really great for uh, some of the topics we'll be talking about tonight. And they're absolutely excellent with all the tax related legal issues. Thanks, Brian. I'll also add that they've been absolutely instrumental in helping us um, as, uh, as a community um, navigate through some of the rule changes that they've tried to force on us. They're great people. I've known them for several years, and it's been a real pleasure working with them. I refer my clients to them. So, But Brian will be talking more about that later on. Uh, next, we have uh, my group. Grand Avenue Business Brokers at A Better Way Realty. And at A Better Way Realty, we do lease options for group homes. And if you're curious about what that program looks like, there's our website, ralleaseoptions.com. That kind of explains the whole program. Uh, I've been very busy with the um, business brokerage, the activity we've had over the last couple months. Um, Beginning of May, we purchased through our program a 58 unit independent and assisted living facility for eight and a half million dollars for one of our clients. We also, for another client, purchased four memory care homes just uh, at the beginning of this month for 3.2 million. Um, I helped a client sell an 11 bed assisted living facility for 800,000. We also um, helped a client. Uh, we sold a 16 bed assisted living. This was one of our clients that exercised their lease option. And that 16 bed went for 1.6 million. Closing Friday, we're doing our first national uh, deal and that's a 16 bed in Maryland for 850,000. And next week I've got a closing of a 43 bed for 2.6 million. So if you need any help buying or selling, I'd sure like to help you. You can reach me on my cell. It's right there, 888-0078. And now news from Cala, Janet. Yep, am I muted? You're up, Janet. Okay, am I muted or am I good? No, we can hear you. Okay, good. Well, I'm a volunteer with Cala. I am the secretary on the board. We have um, 11 board members. Um, we re represent about, you know, over 650 facilities in Colorado. I think we're licensed for 710. We have a membership program. Um, we try to support the industry as a whole, both large facilities and small facilities, try to offer some training. Um, our state health department is sometimes difficult to navigate some of their training. So we try to put some stuff up there that's easy to understand and give you guys an arm of support with a direct contract contact with someone in your area, whether you be large or small. Um, and that's what we do. We have, do have a fall conference coming up with some awesome speakers. And we do monthly trainings. I would encourage anybody in Denver to join Cala. We do Tuesday trainings on some of the regulations that are hard to understand. So that's what we do here in Denver for our folks in Colorado. So please join us for Cala. The membership is reasonable and uh, I think we have done a good job of trying to advocate for our industry. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you, Janet. And also, give, I want to give a shout out to Janet. She was our presenter last month, and she is a consultant. So if you need any help trying to figure her out and maneuver through things, uh, Janet's available. I'm sure she will have her information into the chat screen. And uh, she's very sharp. She understands this business very well. So thanks, Janet, for talking about Cala. All right, next I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Brian Pinkowski. Uh, I met Brian, oh, I think it's been four years now at the Rownot Con. And uh, him and his wife, Michelle, are just instrumental, very sharp people, um, great attorneys and wonderful, wonderful people as well. And I appreciate Brian coming on and giving us this presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing mine and turn the controls over to Brian. Well, thank, thank you, Vern. Um, I don't know when everybody's national conventions are. Let me just say that uh, with respect to the um, national convention for the National Association, ours is uh, October, uh, September 30th through October 3rd in Phoenix. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't conflict with Kala. All right. 
So now when I'm making a presentation, it's a little bit difficult to tell if somebody has a question or a chat or something like that. So uh, Vern or perhaps Vern, you can mute everybody and then just let me know there's a question to answer along the way. That would be very helpful. Vern. You bet. <clears throat> All right, very good. So we're gonna talk about how to buy an, assist, an existing assisted living. Now there's seven basic elements and you don't need to make notes on this unless you particularly want to. There's a blog that we've written on this very topic that you'll be able to capture the link for at the end of the presentation. So you kind of just focus on what we're talking about here and, and raise questions along the way. <clears throat> there's seven basic parts that, that you need to keep track of as you're doing your purchase of an existing assisted living. The first is the actual property. And but what I mean by that is how it is owned, how you choose to own the property. The next is the operations part of the business. Again, that's about how it is owned. Uh, then the next is, is the real estate contract itself. There's a couple of particularities with respect to the real estate contract that you need to make sure of um, as you're going forward. And because of the two different businesses that you'll probably have involved with the real estate and the operations. And the next is the asset purchase agreement. Um, if you have an asset purchase agreement, whether you're working with somebody like uh, ABW or, or some angel investor to help you purchase the real estate, there's probably an asset purchase agreement. Otherwise, you've got a straight up loan. There's some, some questions about that that we'll go over. And then because you've got two different entities, a real estate holding company and an operations company, there's going to be a land lease between those. So there's that aspect of it. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I misspoke. It was the asset purchase agreement, the asset purchase agreement. So that's the contract that allows somebody to purchase the items, the objects, the things associated with the um, operations. And we'll talk about why that contract is necessary. And then the last item is zoning um, and dealing with the number of residents. So a lot of people will buy a piece of property and they say, oh, this is a big, great. It's a beautiful piece of property. I'm in love with it. Uh, and then they have purchased it, they're under contract, they start remodeling, and then they find out that they need 10 beds in order to make the business succeed, but then they went into un unpredicted problems uh, with the city or with the uh, HOA. And we'll go over all of those. All right, so the real estate. So what I mean about the real estate, of course, is how you own it. Now you can find a beautiful piece of real estate and, and that's wonderful. But ultimately, when you put this business portfolio together, there will be a single most valuable piece of it. And that is in the assisted living, typically the real estate. So you will want to protect that real estate somehow. You'll have to develop the right corporate structure. Uh, first of all, you'll need a, a corporate structure. You won't want to own it personally. Because if somebody sues, let's, let's, let's suppose that one of the daughters of one of the residents uh, gets angry because of something real or imagined and chooses to try and sue you, um, you don't want them to be able to get to your most valuable asset. So we'll talk a little bit about how you do that, but it's important to separate that out. So when I talk about the real estate from this perspective, it's about asset protection. So asset protection is an essential part of this business. <clears throat> there you go, asset protection. Now your operations company is a similar situation. You don't wanna have your real estate owned by uh, a company that you've set up to protect that valuable asset, the real estate, and then own operations personally, because then if somebody sues you associated with something that took place in the operations, then you've got the same problem. They can access your ownership of that real estate. So you don't wanna go there either. You need to set up protection for the operations company and for the real estate. Now, what does that look like? <clears throat> so you've got your operations company. This is the, the two minute primer on what asset protection looks like in the assisted living business. And it might look a little complicated as we go through this, but it's really not. It's not that complicated. Uh, you'll have an operations company. Now that's where most of the risk and liability is. 
There will be employees who have all manner of horrible things happening in their personal lives. Uh, who knows what goes on in, with them? And then they will bring that to work and then they'll be upset about something that happened. And maybe they'll be caught with, with stealing some of the medications or they'll make a mistake on the job and blame somebody or they'll have some domestic violence at home and then choose not to come to work one day and somebody ends up being neglected. A lot of problems can happen on this part of the business, but this is the heart of the business is the operations. And people generally get in this business, not so much because they wanna be uh, you know, the next billionaire, but because they actually care about people. Now it's good to care about people and make a decent profit. And you can do that in assisted living. But there are crazy people associated with uh, your community. Um, they're not crazy. They might be angry or stressed, or they might have all manner of issues going on with them. Um, and those can be employees. Those can be uh, uh, family members. Those can be <laughs> somebody who slips and falls outside your facility. Those can be uh, the state. Those can be all kinds of folks who create difficulties. Those can be angry neighbors who decided they are just offended by the uh, prospect of having three or more elderly people living next to them. <clears throat> Those can be all kinds of people that create problems for the operations of your assisted living. So you need to protect that. <clears throat> and so there's asset protection strategies to that you put in place. And one of those is how you form the corporations for the operations company. Uh, and you do that by your choice of a limited liability company, which is what we see most often, or a corporate entity of, of another type, which can be, we could talk about separately if we, if we wanted to talk about that. All right, as I said, the real estate is the most valuable piece of your business. <clears throat> and so you want to protect that. Uh, if somebody is going to try and sue you in the assisted living operations, uh, they're thinking, well, first of all, who knows what they're thinking, but their attorney is thinking, what do they have of value? Let's go get that real estate. Let's go get the pile of money that is someplace that we can get an access. Those, those little devils off to the right there, they want the cash. And the only real cash other than cash flow uh, with assisted living is the real estate. So they can kill the business, um, but then they don't get any money. So what they want is your asset, the real estate. <clears throat> so you got to put in place uh, corporate entities to separate the real estate from the operations. <clears throat> now, you might have several investors who are associated with the real estate. In truth, you could have investors who are associated with the operations as well, but we're, we're gonna talk just about the investors who are associated with the real estate. Each of them, we want to protect as well. And you are one of those investors, quite likely. You wanna protect each of those investors. And you do that by potentially creating another corporate entity which separates the investors from the real estate so that, uh, great, we're gonna, let's suppose that the nightmare scenario happens and they go after the real estate, the real estate's under a mortgage um, and that mortgage is separated by that corporate entity and, and the actual cash that they wanna try and get out of it, they have to penetrate now three corporate entities to try and get to real cash. Uh, but most investors, if they lose the real estate or some portion of the real estate, that's not fatal. But you don't want these entities, you don't want the troublemakers to be able to think that they can access your cash, your personal home, your car, your income, um, and that of your investors. So you put in place additional barriers. And all of these are typically corporate entities. So investor one may hold his portion of the, there'll be a real estate entity typically a limited liability company, although there are other choices. That's mostly what we see in Colorado. We see a limited liability company. So this, this big bar here, can you see my cursor? Nod your head if you can see my cursor. Okay, thank you very much. So typically there'll be a limited liability company that houses all of these investors and each of the investors themselves will own a limited liability company that is the owner or member of the real estate LLC. So it looks like a lot of barriers, 
which is exactly the point. You want to try and protect your personal assets, the assets of the real estate, <clears throat> the asset that is the real estate, and not so much worried about the operations. You'll see why when we get to that part of it. <clears throat> and of course, this is not to scale. Okay, the real estate contract. <clears throat> you got to choose the right entity. Uh, now, when you have decided what your ownership structure is going to be, whether it's a limited liability company or otherwise, um, let me go back a step. And we have these investors and they all have their LLCs. And then they form a LLC that will own the real estate. <clears throat> now this is, okay, we're not gonna get into too many complications, but there'll be an LLC that owns the real estate. And that LLC is the name you want in the real estate contract. Now there might be guarantors, but that's a different matter. The actual ownership of the correct entity needs to be in the real estate contract. So your starting point is not, gee golly, I, I have found this piece of property that I'm absolutely in love with. Your starting point needs to be, well, how am I gonna own this property to protect myself and my investors? <clears throat> so that's the first question is, what name entity, and by entity, I mean corporate entity, is going to be in the real estate contract. Now, you want, you're not buying a business. That's the first thing to know when you're playing the asset protection game with respect to uh, assisted living, you are not buying a business. You're buying the stuff of the business, the objects, the items. You're buying the filing cabinets, the beds, the sheets, the, the contracts, the website, the telephone number, you're not buying the business because if you were buying the business, you would also be buying the liabilities of the business. So if one of the caregivers is about to file a claim on the company, then you bought that as well. You bought that potential liability. So you wanna separate that. And you do that by buying only the assets of the business. <clears throat> That's a very important point to get clear uh, and people will get in trouble uh, about that. So, and it's not you that's buying the assets. It is your limited liability company, your corporate entity that is buying that, not you personally. That is really, really important. And this is the reason, This the questions about this that I've gotten over the last year are the reasons why I offered to Vern to give this talk. People get confused on this point. Oh, okay. Now, <clears throat> uh, raise your hand or give me some kind of thumbs up or something if you've read any of Kiyosaki's books. All right, so now Kiyosaki defines an asset as something that's generating cash for you. But that's a business model thought that is not common. Uh, bankers, uh, real estate brokers, people, lenders, um, and people who are suing you think of assets as a thing of value. So I thought I'd take a moment here to go over this, this definition with you. All right, a useful or valuable thing, person or quality. Quick reflexes, we're his chief asset. Good, the school is an asset to the community. And it is also property owned by a person regarded as having value and available to meet debts. Something that somebody can sue and take from you in order to pay your obligations. All right. And this comes from an old der derivation of this. It comes from enough and to satisfy, to satisfy, to, to be enough, which kind of makes sense. This is, you know, an asset is something that's to provide some guarantee that somebody can do something. Kiyosaki is brilliant, but it's uh, common not to have a big argument about what an English word means as, as most other people use it. So when we do an asset purchase agreement, we're purchasing the things of value and those things of value in an assisted living are really the contracts and the beds, not the real estate. We're separating the real estate <clears throat> and we're certainly not buying the liabilities.
So again, what are those assets? Bed sheets, inventory, computer files, trade names, goodwill. So you might have a good reputation in the community. So you can buy the assets of the business, not the business, and still benefit from the goodwill. A location might have a good, good reputation there in a community. So that's very important. And so that's typically the stuff, that the items that are listed in an asset purchase agreement. These are not in the asset purchase agreement and these are things specifically to be avoided. Taxes, penalties, back pay, legal liabilities from employees or families of residents. Because if you're in the assisted living business, by definition, you will see people die. <clears throat> and sometimes uh, family members are upset about that. <clears throat> okay, so you've set up your, your, let's just suppose that they're limited liability companies to own the operations and another limited liability company to own the real estate. Um, but you need your investors, the ones who are helping fund the real estate, you need them to get paid. And you typically do that through the rent, through the lease, the land lease uh, for use of the property. So in addition to your corporate entities, you will have a lease agreement between the operations company and the real estate company. But wait, they're the same people. No, they're not the same people. They are two different persons. And by persons, I'm using now a legal definition of person, which is includes a corporate person, a corporate entity. So, yep. We got to have an agreement between these two. So this is typically where your, your investors will get their payment is through the real estate lease. And since it's a real estate lease and not profit or something, then it's harder to attach. And, if they're, and by attach, I mean make a claim against if you're uh, suing somebody. <clears throat> which leads us to the lease purchase agreement. So ABW is well regarded around the country, not just Colorado, around the nation for making it easy for people to acquire quickly the land so that they can offer buy an existing ALR. So you'll need that document as well. Now, typically that lease purchase agreement will include the right to buy somebody out, but there'll be some lease, there'll be, and, and it'll be a typical landlord sort of lease. It's got a lot of things in it. You've got to have insurance and insect control and stay in compliance with state, uh, state regulations and, and ordinary lease things. The only difference is that there'll be an option to purchase, which is one of the great things that uh, ABW provides. Okay, zoning. <clears throat> um, all right, close your ears, Vern. But what we run into a lot is that a real estate agent will say, not Vern, but other real estate agents will say, ah, you know, you can't do that here. Uh, the HOA won't like it. Or you can't do that because it needs to be in an industrial zone or something else. So probably the biggest thing we do for people around the nation is we help them get through that thinking. Because here's the thing that you need to know. You are dealing with elderly disabled. You're not dealing with elderly. You're dealing with people who are by definition disabled. If they weren't disabled, they wouldn't need assisted living. That means that they are protected by a federal law called the Fair Housing Act. And that Fair Housing Act trumps any silly municipal law, any HOA. <clears throat> and there are some stupid, stupid city laws around this country. It is amazing. There is a city in Colorado um, which allows you to have two pot-bellied pig, five goats, a cow, and bees in a residential neighborhood, but thou shalt not have three or more elderly people in your property. 
<laughs> so there are some yahoos out there who are terrified of the elderly. Um, and we're looking for a client who absolutely wants to push on that on that particular button. And, and, and many of these cities know that uh, what they're doing is illegal, um, but unless somebody's willing to push them on it through another lawyer, then, then that's just how it is. Now, zoning is important for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is where you can put a place. And then the next most important reason is how many beds you need. So a lot of people think, wow, it's a, it's a 5,000 square foot house. Okay, so uh, it's a 5,000 5, square foot house, but there might be zoning limitations on what you can do with that property and how many people you can put in that property. So this is, as I say, the biggest thing we do for people around the country is we help them overcome those zoning restrictions, um, which often the real estate agent will, will miss uh, or they won't understand. Um, because this is a bit of a, a specialty area where the elderly disabled get to live. And generally the elderly disabled can live any damn where they want. And they're protected by federal law. So it's not about you, it's about your residents. You are not protected. You're just the landlord for these elderly people and they can live wherever they want. And so the, but zoning will have implications for where you live. And so that, as I said, that's the number one thing we help people with. And often the way you overcome zoning limitations is with what's called a reasonable accommodation request because the cities and corporate entities have to make a reasonable accommodation to meet the needs of disabled people. <clears throat> and that reasonable accommodation can have economic grounds uh, as well as other grounds. Now you can't say, look, my business won't won't make it unless we can have 16 beds in uh, in in the Highland neighborhood of Denver, which for those of you who don't know, is a, it's a relatively dense neighborhood with uh, with houses built 100 years ago, which are pretty close together. A 16 bed place just won't work in that neighborhood. You'd have to have two lots to do it. So trying to to cram 16 beds into that neighborhood just because you economically need it to work is probably an uphill battle. But if you're looking for eight beds or 10 beds or something like that, there are, these things are usually more achievable. And as I said, that's one of our principal things that we do. Um, all right, now we have covered a lot of ground really, really quickly, and I haven't seen any questions, but perhaps there were. Let me pause at this point and see if there's questions. And I can't call on people, so just shout out. Okay, so if you're actually buying a pre-existing business, the best thing to do is is not actually buy the business itself. Like you, you're saying that you want to buy the land and then buy all the the stuff that's inside of it, but then basically start from scratch again, like like. You know, I mean, go in and, you know, apply for another license and apply for a new, you know, every, you know, apply for everything basically anew um, for a brand new business. So you're not buying. Yeah, let me just, that's correct, uh, Jessica. And the way that sounds perhaps a little foreboding, but the truth of the matter is when you buy an existing assisted living, um, the health department in most states doesn't understand corporate stuff. So they're just thinking it's just a change of ownership of an existing business. Legally, that's not true, but you know we're dealing with government people. They don't know. The, the way we handle that in, in, through the regulations is what's called a change of ownership. Now that is true. You have to do a change of ownership, whether you're buying an existing business uh, where 5% or more than 5% of the ownership is changing hands, or there's a new owner of what they call the business, but what we call the assets. Um, that's an important legal distinction for us, but they don't care about that. So you'll have to do a change of ownership application. Now, the thing about a change of ownership application in Colorado is that the obligations for a change of ownership application are almost identical to a new application. So you're not like, oh my God, I have to start anew. Okay, yeah, but you're, you have to do that anyway. 
you gotta you gotta complete the application. You gotta submit your your uh, police report information and fingerprints, and you gotta tell them about your past criminal activities and and all that sort of thing. So you have to do that anyway. So don't let that appear to be an obstacle for you. I would chime in on that as well. Um, so Jessica, normally what we see in that case is that license is an asset and the goodwill is an asset too. So typically what we'll see happen is they'll do a change of ownership. If it was uh, ABC Assisted Living Incorporated, then they may fire up ABC Assisted Living um, LLC, or maybe they're uh, Joe's assisted living doing business as ABC assisted living. So they keep the name because that name's an asset. The goodwill of that name is an asset. And also plus you can still keep the client if you can, Well, when you transfer the license, sometimes you can, you can make an agreement with the, with, the, with the owner when you're buying the license and they have a client in it and they wanna keep the, the client, they wanna move. You can work a deal with, you know, then you need Brian to help you out. Yeah, so let me clarify, give us a couple of points. Now, among the assets that you purchase with the asset purchase agreement is not just the bedpans and sheets, it's also the contracts and the contacts and the files. So you are buying those contracts. Now, of course, every resident has the opportunity to move or do whatever they want. Um, and that's true in Colorado as it is any other place. So typically it's a 30 day period where they can say, all right, I'm out. Um, so you're going to, you're going to have that 30 day. Basically it's like 30, it's like a month to month tenancy. tenancy. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing uh, is that you are buying those contracts and most people don't want to move mom. The caregivers typically end up staying the same. Uh, you'll have to change your employment agreements with people if you have employment agreements. Now, the other thing is that the license itself is not really an asset. It is something that you, the, that the current owner can help with, but the current owner doesn't own the license. They don't own it like they own something else. They have the right to be in business, um, but they can't sell that right to be in business. So the most that a current owner can do is facilitate the change of ownership. Um, and so I thought you might want to take note of that in particular, it, Vern, is that they can, you can, I can, if I have the license now, I can facilitate by helping the new owner deal with the health department. And that's typically what we see in asset purchase agreements, but it's not something I can say, okay, Here's my asset purchase agreement. Give me the license. No, the health department has to go through the process with every new owner. So you're actually kind of buying the um, the name, really. I mean, I mean that's kind of. So you're not actually buying the license. You're buying more the name of like, you know, like Vern said of such and such LLC doing business as. That's right. The name of them. That's right. So I mean, the goodwill is super valuable. If people know that that place on the corner is an assisted living, that's valuable. That's really valuable. And if you, whether you have the name or change the name over time is not so important. You've acquired that name when you, when you purchase that asset. Brian, I have, so I have can you Cornell. Um, if you buy a, an assisted living facility that has issues, do you buy their problems or is it a way of change of ownership? Well, when you when it changes ownership, those problems have to go away um, before the change before the change of ownership with the license is allowed to take place. So, depending on what problems there were, uh, the health department might say, "That's great, so glad you guys came to an agreement, but you still need to to put that that security fence in the backyard because that's something that we cited you for as a deficiency, and you still need to do that." But here's the thing with those kinds of things. Um, you need an inspection or a survey, we call it in Colorado. You need a survey before you can open with that new license anyway. So they will come in typically at the last minute, making everybody nervous. If you're supposed to close on October 30th and they'll come in on the 29th 
and do a survey of everything. And, <laughs> and then you're going, you're on pins and needles waiting to find out what it is that they think they need. So you don't buy the problems. And in fact, that is a strategy that some people will follow is it, you know, it's time for me to sell. Time for me to sell. The health department has gotten crosswise with me personality wise or for whatever reason. And it's time for me to sell. And, and then those problems don't transfer to the new facility. Uh, typically new facility owner, um, which is typically one of the reasons people ultimately rebrand or change the name. And so when you go on to the state in Colorado, we have a, a website that allows people to see the past, uh, they call them deficiencies or citations. Um, you can see for each, each facility, it's history of negative citations. But if there's a new facility, then you won't see that. So it could be a new facility, same old address, and those problems went with the last owner. Can you walk me through the transition? So let's say you've got something under contract and you're, and you're closing. So what happens like the day you close with the license? Are you, you have to have the new license in place or can you work off the old previous owner's license? How does that work? All right, there's a bit more subtlety involved with that one. So you, the ideal situation is you've closed on the real estate and you've simultaneously closed on the asset purchase agreement. And that asset purchase agreement uh, requires that you, typically this is how the contracts are written, that asset purchase agreement requires that your um, license has successfully changed hands with the health department via the permission of the health department. Now, sometimes for, for life reasons that happen, on planet Earth, the that that license transfer is not ready. Uh, the health department couldn't get out there in time, or they came out there and said, "You know, you really do need to do that fence," or yeah, "We don't like those steps," or "You know, we just changed the regulations on what you need to do with fireplaces and bathrooms." Could be anything like that, and now everyone is cursing and jumping up and down. And the answer to that is typically in a, an additional agreement between the previous owner and the new owner to continue to operate. All right, buddy, you, you're, you've been operating there for five, 10 years. You need to operate for another month or another 30 days or another 10 days or, or, or something like that. And, and a fair amount of um, negotiation will take place in order to make that work because the old owner wants to get out and get his money. The new owner wants to get in and he's not going to make as much money or she's not going to make as much money if, if she has to pay the uh, previous operator and license to do something. Uh, that is the generality of it. It can get so, more flexible sorry. than that. So in this case, you already closed the property. Okay, your, your company or your LLC already closed the property. Then you go through to the to, to the change of ownership applications, or you say that is almost identical with the new applications. So Often. then, if that yeah, almost, if that not go through, if things need to uh, extensions, uh, let's say the 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 health departments come and check and see that this one is not not right. You have to correct this one first in order to change of ownership or new applications then it will delay the business uh, changing hand or not the assets, okay? Then when you buy the property, you should have a lease in place just in case that if the business or the change of whatever is not go through, then you rent it to the old owner until the old owner get it through that change to the new owner, then new owner will operate. So that, that, that time, like you say that the old owner want to get out, the new owner want to get in, but the, no, the new owner cannot get in. So that is the gap for them to fix. Then that should be have a lease in place, right? Correct? Can be a lease, can be a management agreement. Um, it depends on what the issue is that's causing a delay. If it's, there's a new fence that needs to be built or something physical, that's a fairly easy thing to handle. If uh, they couldn't get somebody out to inspect on time, that's a different kind of an issue. If so one of that, your, if you one of your, it, 
let me, let Catherine, let me go ahead and finish. If you're, if one of your, if there's a problem with your application, like uh, one of your investors has got a criminal background or uh, that, that's unacceptable or, or um, had a license denied or canceled in another state or something like that, and they find out about it, there are a number of different kinds of possibilities. And, and it's hard to plan for those, um, but I can tell you that people do work through them. So you say the first one is the can be uh, the lease can be the operations agreement or the whatever agreement what you say can be or you can just it could be a reverse sort of a real estate lease uh, this is a you know this is kind of a, a, an opportunity to share stories I'm sure Vern has seen a couple of stories that might apply uh, you know one of them might be that the that the old owner is now renting the property from you to operate for a period of time while the license transfer happens. There's a number of different ways to handle it. I have never seen a deal go through where the timing worked out. <laughs> so, um, and usually it is either a management agreement or a lease of the business until they can get their license in place. But that, that brings up a question that I wanted to ask you about a stock sale. And in a stock sale, would that license go with the stock? Again, the license is not something that can be owned by whoever's holding the license. So all you have is the right to facilitate the transfer. So the license, if it's held by a company and a company is sold, <clears throat> doesn't that license go with the company itself as a stock sale, not as an asset sale? Okay, now we're getting into some sophistication here. I don't know what our audience knows about the difference between um, what are called C corporations and LLCs. If uh, I'll try to avoid too much detail, but Vern is referring to a situation where it's not a limited liability company. It is uh, a, a C corporation. And a C corporation, well, the way to think about all corporations is that they are an imaginary friend. Your imaginary friend goes forth and does business. Your imaginary friend gets in trouble and tracks legal liabilities, but you don't. So the original corporate form was the, was the C corporation. And the C corporation is, okay, I don't, I'm not the company. I just own a piece of the company through stock. Limited liability companies are fairly recent animals created. <clears throat> I think they came from Germany initially. And so, but the C corporation, I just own the stock of IBM. So if I sell my stock in IBM, all the licenses that IBM has, is that affected? And the answer to that for assisted living in Colorado is it depends on the percentage of ownership. So if there's a change in the, in the ownership of more than 5% then a, oh wait, I might have that wrong. Well, I'm not gonna get into Colorado specifically because we have people from all over the country, but each, each place is gonna have a regulatory requirement that says what the percentage change of ownership is that will require a filing of a change of ownership. And in some places, it's as low as 5%. Uh, in some places, if there's a 50% change, um, then, then you have to file a change of ownership. So the answer, I give this to you in all seriousness as a lawyer, it depends. <laughs> what about Medicaid billing? Uh, could that, in a stock sale, be a, an easier process? I don't see what the issue is. What, what's the issue? Well, Medicaid billing is a long drawn out process just to get approved for Medicaid. So if somebody's buying a Medicaid facility and it can take anywhere from two weeks to two months to get that Medicaid approval for the billing, and you have to get a new number and there, it's just, it's a nightmare. So if somebody was to purchase the stock of a company and it already has all that in place, could that just transfer over so that it's seamless in the billing process. I haven't run into that. I don't know for a fact, but it seems, you're right. It, when you get your, your Medicaid billing certification, um, 
that I've never seen two weeks. So God bless you if you've got a client who's got it done in two weeks. I've seen nothing less than three months. So three to six months to get, get approval to bill for Medicaid, which creates financial management issues that uh, I would talk to you about if you were contacting me to purchase a, a Medicaid facility uh, so that you had financial capacity to withstand those couple of months. Now, um, if there's just a change of ownership, I don't know that that's going to affect the Medicaid billing process. If if I have a change of ownership where my company in Colorado, I, I'm selling my 5% of Janet's uh, LLC. Um, and, and it's got a, it's got a, a, a license in place, then there's a change of ownership question that I have to check out to determine, you know, whether or not that's going to require a filing, but I don't know that that affects the Medicaid billing, um, in Colorado or anywhere else. Oh, and it looks like Amanda from Florida has either a question or an answer. Yes, I have a question, Brian. I have a question about when you said um, you have a different purchase agreement for the assets. Who signs this purchase agreement? Is it the entity that is buying the real estate or is the operational entity? It's the operational entity is buying the assets. Okay. It's, so it's not an addendum to the real estate purchase. It's, it's a no. completely different document that the operation entity is buying and then the real estate right. is buying the real estate. That's oh. right. And okay. I, will, I will commonly see the asset purchase agreement and the operations company <laughs> referred to referred to in the real estate contract. Uh, but the principal reason for doing that is, is to point out that there is a, a, a timing that is being attempted with the sale of the real estate contract. Because you know there's usually a date that says the real estate changes hand 30 days from now or 60 days from now. Uh, or whatever date that people are optimistically hoping for. And then as they go along, there'll, there'll be some adjustments and they, they have to get both of those to harmonize. Mm -hmm. have to get both of those things to close at the same time. Thank you. How many entities are we looking at setting up then? At least, at least two. At least, okay. Like, at least two. So you got one for the operations company, one for the real estate holding company. Uh, depending on your investors, you might need additional companies. So if you have investors with you holding the real estate, it's commonly see, I will commonly see that each of those investors will then create another LLC to own that real estate, to own its share of the real estate. But you know, limited liability companies are easy to form. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Is there any difference in, in how you would structure like uh, if you're like syndicating one of these types of deals? Um, I say you're buying like a portfolio and you want to syndicate. Is there like create a, a holding company and then um, that has 100% ownership of uh, the operating entity and the real estate entity, those two are separate. And then like your GP and LP is up on the, the holding company level. Okay. So, um, you know, using the word syndication doesn't convey any new magic to what is shown in this image. So you see, I have investor one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, now it might be, oh, hang on a second here. It might be that investor two is an LLC and its members are the contributors to your syndication. Uh, and by syndication, we just mean investment, yeah. investment, okay? So investor two there might, might have you know, 15 people involved in it. I don't know if it's a really, really large deal and they've made contributions. They have quote unquote syndicated, uh, which just means they've organized an investment together. Um, and so, I think that's all there is to it without looking at a specific situation. Does that answer the question, Chris? Yeah. I have a yeah, question. I was just trying to, yeah. Sorry. Um, I have a question about, I'm getting a mortgage for the real estate and um, I applied in my own name and I asked the uh, real estate, the um, mortgage guy, whatever, the loan officer, if 
I could use my LLC's name to purchase the real estate. And he said, just put it in our name. And then once the mortgage is done, we can just go to the city or assessor or whatever it is and change the name from us to our business name. But I don't know that that, that would, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm asking? Oh, yeah. This is like the most common question that we run into on a daily basis. What state are you in? Arizona. Arizona. So get yourself a, an Arizona real estate attorney. Well, I, I work with Anderson, so they probably. They, they will know the answer to this question off the cuff. Okay. Um, but I can tell you one thing for certain. Uh, your mortgage broker is not an attorney. Right. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I'm like, hmm, I don't know about this. Okay, well, I'm sure I them. He's thinking, let's get this sale done and you can deal with right. all that stuff later when it's when I've already handled you. Right. So, but I but this is an important liability point, and then it just creates confusion for you later. So tell everybody to take a breath, have your phone call with Anderson and handle it. I'll throw you a, a little bit of my experience with that, Melissa, because I just mm -hmm. bought a rental property that I'm doing that with. So the first thing I did was told the title company I want to hold open on the policy. Okay, and then I'm going to be transferring that property into um, <clears throat> into an LLC with the risk that the mortgage company could call the note. So there's always a risk if you do a, a change of ownership that the mortgage company could call, call that note. But I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to transfer it into an LLC. I'm going to call up my insurance company and have that insurance switched over to my LLC um, and I will call the title company and say, I want that commitment in my LLC's name. So it is possible to do, but there is some risk that you should be aware of. And again, your attorney can, can help yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I have a question. I have a question on the, uh, opposite, I guess a similar side of that question. I'm right now underwriting a rather large loan and um, we have the ownership under an LLC but the bank just told us the loan's approved, but with the only way I'll approve it is you sign on the loan as you, not the LLC. And so they're having me restructure the how we work the operating agreement. I mean, is that normal? Because I've had that happen twice now. It's not unusual for banks to want a person, not a brand new LLC without history, um, to be on the note that's pretty typical and, and a solution to that, and there can be other solutions to it, but a common solution to that is I'm going to guarantee this thing personally, but I want my company to own it is typically the, the, the way I've seen that handled. Uh, Vern, again, you've seen considerably more real estate deals than, than I have. Um, what have you seen? Well, my experience with that just recently was I wanted to buy it in my LLC but my rate was a half point higher. So if I bought it personally, I saved that half point, which increased my cash flow significantly. So I chose to, you know, take that risk and expect they're not going to call the note because they're going to be getting the payments regularly. But they could call the note. That is always a risk. Um, we've not heard of that happening before, except for Chaffa. I know has done it. Chaff is a Colorado, uh, basically a, a low income type of a um, program, but usually the mortgage companies are not going to do that, but they have the right and you have to be aware of that. So I, I did it just to save 300 bucks a month. I've seen, I mean, this is just on strictly on a like single family rental properties, but I ran into it when I was acquiring uh, two rental properties and the mortgage broker, um, I just happened to ask like towards the last minute. And he's like, if I had known, I would not even have talked to you and engaged in this, that you were trying to do that. Cause I said, can I like, buy this and I'll see or switch it after I buy my personal name? Cause I had the same thing. It was like a half point um, discount. So, you know, I talked to Anderson and they they were like, look, after you close, just put this right into like a, a trust, um, you know, privacy trust. And then uh, the beneficial owner of that will be your like Nevada or Wyoming LLC. 
Um, and that way the garden St. Germain Act protects you from the um, mortgage company being able to call your loan due. Um, so that's kind of one way. Yeah, the asset protection, I'm gonna use the word scheme, but I, I mean that in the way of plan. Asset protection scams can, uh, uh, plans can, can be put together a lot, of, a lot of different ways. Oh my God, that was a terrible. So what I, <laughs> what I heard is, what I heard is uh, when you use your personal names to buy it and then you quick claim to your LLC, but you still, uh, you still pay your mortgage, but you can quick claim. That's what I heard. You can uh, quick claim. Well, you didn't hear that here. Um, but we do see that people do that. Okay, thank you. I miss it. Okay, good. So there, again, there are. Look, we're talking about some specific kinds of situations, and these are things where you need to talk to your attorney in your state um, to work through this specific real estate question. But it's part of your overall asset protection strategy and it's part of the things that you need to consider um, when you are organizing to purchase a business now it sounds like we're talking about a whole lot of things uh it's like oh my god i have to do all this planning and doing and whatnot before i can go and and put an offer on this house or um <clears throat> but first of all it's a serious endeavor and you want to do it you want to treat it seriously and and secondly it, it doesn't take that much time uh, so if you're working with somebody like Anderson, they can they can pop out these these limited liabilities and asset protection strategies for you very very quickly. Um, if you're working with us in in the state of Colorado where we do corporate law, again, it's also very quickly. Um, and then you go on to the next next pieces. We you, you've done your market research. You've you figured out where. <clears throat> where your property should be, you've handled your zoning questions, and then boom, uh, all of that can take two weeks. Uh, I don't know how long Anderson takes to do things nowadays, but maybe three weeks total, and then you can make an offer on the property if it, if it makes sense. And then from there, things take anywhere from 30 days to 90 days, typically. One question uh, on structuring, um, I think it'll be quick, right? It's, do you, pull out like your workforce from that. So you have your real estate entity, your operating entity, and could you set up like your own like management company and have all your workforce there? And then like that kind of just separates the liability a little bit from operations because then like operations and you probably won't have uh, like employee type of issues. You'll have that kind of concentrated in your operating or your management entity. Yeah, yeah we've seen that as well. I mean, there are a lot of ways that you can handle creating those barriers between things. And one of them is management companies, others home health care agencies. Uh, it's just a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, but I guess there's not so many. There's probably five to 10 ways to approach all of those things. And they've all been handled. Uh, it kind of depends on what works best for you and what you think, what you, think you can manage. All right, I'm gonna take, take the next question from Mohammed. Yes, Brian, ahead, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, well, so far I think I can say something. Okay, uh, I wanted to ask a question with regard to purchasing an existing uh, business, but then you, you talked about maybe the whole transferring of things and getting all the billing takes some time. What are things that one can do to help uh, shorten that duration instead of, you know, whether it's uh, private care or Medicare, what could you do ahead during the purchasing process to uh, make that duration shorter? Well, um, I, what I have observed, Mohammed, is in in, I, I happen to know Mohammed's in, in Colorado. What I've observed is that it takes 30 to 60 days to make everything come together. So in that 30 to 60 days from the time you have made your offer on your contract, on your, on your property, uh, to the time you're ready 
you've, you've completed your inspection from the health department and you're ready to open, um, you'll be really, really busy. Uh, and you'll know everything about that business uh, up and down. So I don't know that you need to, to do too much more other than your regular due diligence. So as part of your, your asset purchase agreement, you'll have the opportunity, if, at least if we do your asset purchase agreement, you'll have the opportunity to have some due diligence on employee files on your resident contracts, because some of those residents might not be appropriate for your business model. Um, I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago who handles traumatic brain injury people. And he said, well, you know what? All those assisted living people who are not traumatic brain injury, they've got to be moved out. So you, you, you current owner need to move it someplace else. <clears throat> so again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But employee handling and resident contracts, they're not that complicated. Your billing system, you're going to have to learn how to do that. Uh, but what I observe is that people who are committed to make this happen, they figure out what they need to do and they get their bookkeepers in board or they engage a previous bookkeeper and they make it go and they learn what they need to learn really quickly in a matter of a week or two. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, of course. I have a, I have a question in general. Let's say that you're getting something under contract, and um, I know what the due diligence period is. It's for getting a loan. It's just you know checking the water heater, etc. But I don't understand factoring in the license. So do you need to add extra time? Like, do you need 90 days? What what's typical to get it start to finish, to get it closed? Well, uh, Vern's got his experience. He's, uh, he's seen at least 19 of these uh, the, in the state of Colorado alone. Uh, I've got my experience. And um, I can tell you that, that what I see is that people will optimistically want 30 days. Um, and then invariably, it ends up being 60 days or 90 days because of one thing or another. Um, so that that's typically what I see, what it takes to get everything coordinated so that the previous owner can walk out the door and the new owner can have full control and everything goes smoothly. That, that's what I see, 60 to 90 days. But I'm sure Vern has seen some additional things. You wanna comment on that, Vern? Well, I would agree with you, 60 to 90 days is usually our target. Um, if you're working with SBA, you, you may have to add another two weeks to a month on top of that. Uh, depending on the the lender themselves, uh, due diligence is is really you know it, it's to check out everything and verify everything that they presented in the initial offering. So if they're saying that we made this much, uh, it's your opportunity to go in and verify that's how much they made, and it, also to sort through and you know figure out is uh, could you increase the bed count, for instance? Um, what, what about your billing of, you know, like what Muhammad brought up? What about the billing on something like that? How, how do you work through all those things? So that's what that due diligence time can and should be used for. Um, but it's, it's really, really tough. You know, sellers, they wanna get it done as quickly as possible. And sometimes the buyer wants to get in there as quickly as possible, but just getting through all of the, the steps that 60 to 90 days is a good point to start from. I always like to put in my contracts that, hey, we have, uh, we have the right to extend um, by adding additional earnest money just in case the bank runs a little bit late. It, it just helps protect you. Let me, let me comment on that a little bit further. Uh, in addition to the finance piece of it, um, uh, I will usually recommend that the buyer bring on a consultant specifically to go check out the property. Uh, you can't catch everything, but if you get somebody experienced, and I'm going to tout Janet Cornell, who's on the line with us here, somebody who's so familiar with the regulations and, and facilities in your area, you can usually walk in and relatively quickly find out if something is really wrong. Uh, not always. <clears throat> I ran into a situation where um, the, the new owner took over and 
and and uh, found a, a stash of diverted drugs down in the basement, uh, tucked tucked in behind something. So the caregivers were keeping a secret stash that they were pinching from the uh, um, from the residents. I mean, you don't know what you're going to find there. Uh, you make some some contract language to try and protect yourself from that, um, but you do run into some things. And so your due diligence period does and should include. Um, the right to go in and, and, and check the property out uh, and check the operations out to make sure that things are running according to oil and not just according to how they represented it to you in your contract. I guess my situation's um, almost, situation's gonna kind of be different. I mean, they're literally just selling the residence and not the business, even though everything, you know, even though the business is there. Um, do I still have the right to go in and ask for their books and all that kind of stuff, even though. All right, now you're asking for specific legal advice, yeah. Jessica. So that yeah. I invite yeah. you to make a phone call with me. If we can have yeah. a consultation. Probably a good idea. Muhammad, your hand is still up, your imaginary hand. Are you still have another question or is, is that it for questions? Uh, I forgot to put it back down. Let me do it. <laughs> okay. All right, anybody else got a question? So I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mohammed. Go ahead, Mohammed. Oh, thank you very much. Um, going back into forming the different LLC corporation, um, I think we touched on it. So to really truly protect even yourself, you should have an LLC for yourself that buys both the real estate and the, and the operation separately. All right, let's take a look here. Let's take a look at my little magic not to scale diagram. Okay, so we got it. We got some sort of corporate entity that owns the operation, some sort of corporate entity that owns the real estate. And depending on the number of investors involved, typically if there's two investors, I would recommend that they each have LLCs. Because you don't, you know, let's suppose that in my example here, we have investor two does something stupid. Um, <clears throat> they get involved in the business and start diverting drugs. And if there's not some kind of barrier here, then this guy or gal's errors then splash onto investor one. So what I typically see is separate limited liability companies for each of the investors. If it's you know one investor doing it, then you know they might still want to have that that uh, well they'll have this one they'll have they'll have the large one between the real estate and them. But if there's if there's two or more investors, I usually see uh, that they will have separate limited liability companies because you don't want the 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 errors and screw ups of one of those investors to to make a problem for the other. Thank you. Okay. I think that about covers it, Vern. We may have one more question coming well, up. I, I don't, I'm sort of formulating my question, but I'm basing on the due diligence. Would you do diligence like, let's say, three to four weeks for um, the physical building? And then would you, would you do like 60 days for the actual? running of the business or I mean how how do you kind of structure what your due diligence is until your money goes hard? Uh, I would work with a consultant such as Janet in Colorado um, and see when they can get out there. Uh, but I don't usually see a different or longer period of time for due diligence of the business. Um, I don't know what Vern sees but you should be able to get through your due diligence in a couple of weeks for both the property, the real estate and the, uh, and the business operations. Wouldn't you agree? Or do you have something to comment on, Bern? I would agree. You want to run them in parallel. Um, sometimes getting all the documents you need from the seller can be challenging, especially if you're asking for bank statements and uh, payrolls and that type of thing. It, it takes a little time for them to get everything together. So, uh, you want to run them in parallel and it's good to have a team to delegate some of those responsibilities. 
I will tell you that that uh, if it's an older facility that's been around for a while and somebody's retiring and wanting to get out, it's not unusual to find that that they don't even use QuickBooks. Uh, and so this this question of having some difficulty to, to get the financial document to get finances together for you to review, um, that is simultaneously not unusual. And it's also a bit of an indication that, that things, hmm, it might be what, what we call a value add proposition, meaning that the business has got some room to be improved. I would agree. We see that a lot, especially with the older facilities and they're not very sophisticated. So I've seen P&Ls on the back of an envelope before. <laughs> and I'd like to chime in. Some of those older businesses don't know internet marketing either. So they are really missing the the whole idea of marketing their home and the, so they might be down on occupancy. Which is great, which is why you're buying that business because it's an opportunity for you. All right, any other questions? Brian, I had an, a question. Um, how important is it when you buy a facility to find out if they're already compliant with state regs or does it matter if you're buying it and it's going to be a wash anyway? Well, it does matter because it tells you something about the quality of care that they provided. So if you've got some, uh, if you've got some caregivers there um, who, who might've been causing problems or bad hiring practices, then that tells you something about the goodwill of the, of the business that you're, um, taking over at least by name, as I said, you're not you know, purchasing the business, you're just purchasing the assets. Uh, but it might tell you that, you know, we need to clean house and do some significant repair. Now, depending on what the value um, of the assets is that you have agreed to with the owner, <clears throat> that could be an important negotiating point. Uh, sometimes I will see people, sometimes I will see people agree to a higher value of the real estate than is the actual value of the real estate because they're trying to, to uh, say that, oh yeah, well, my, I've got a million dollar property. I'll sell it to you for a million five because I've got this existing, this existing business in there, which is easily worth half a million dollars. And, um, and I think you'll get in trouble eventually if you do that, if the lender lets you get away with that. Thank you. I have, an, I have another question on, um, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ah, I'm sorry, right. I'll come back No, here. Yeah, you can come back, but let me, let, me, let me follow up a little further with Janet's question while you, while you regroup over there. Um, and, and that is that uh, for many states, if not all, you can actually go onto the health department website and check out how the, um, I, I get it now. Thank you, Janet, for queuing me up on this. She wanted me to talk about this. <laughs> uh, that the health department will have the deficiencies in history of operations. Uh, and so that tells you something about the goodwill that you're purchasing. It tells you something. It doesn't tell you everything because uh, people at the health department, I'm going to say something crazy here. What they do is noble in the same way that people who care for the elderly is noble but they're still human beings. And so for one reason or another, they might get crosswise with one of the owners and then magically there's a whole lot of deficiencies with a property. And, and uh, in a bit of, uh, let's say, extra special negative treatment happens. So when that happens, the deficiencies don't tell you what the real status of things is. And that's another reason why you really need to have a consultant go and look at how things are really going on the ground there. Uh, yeah, I got tagged with a um, caregiver taking the screen off the kitchen window to, to wash the window. She put her thumb through the window screen and they got me for um, leaving the house at Jeopardy for rodent and, um, rodent and insect infestation through a thumb, thumb screen pop in the screen. You know, I mean, it was so ironic. I mean, it was just Pathetic. Yeah, well, we so should would, we should do another one of these presentations talking about these magic <laughs> words, immediate jeopardy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and they left me vulnerable to rat and, and insect um, infestation by a thumbnail. I said, okay, can a rat get through that? So I think you're right, Brian. You need to do your due diligence and dig a little deeper, you know, because some, some right. the inspectors are, are embellishing what happened. You know? Yes, they're they're rambunctious, as we say, where I'm from, <laughs> rambunctious. All right, you got and your I, question formulated there, Colorado Springs? I think 719 yeah, is Col Colorado Springs, right? <laughs> Yeah, it is. Okay, so I remembered it. So um, let's say I'm looking at a, a larger facility that's gonna it's gonna appraise pretty high, um, but the business right now is just running pretty low. So for me, that's an opportunity. But then my question is, I'm used to apartments where you're valuing it on the NOI and on the cap rate. So if I get this to the point where it, because I'm looking at probably trying to get a residential loan and then, you know, work out the business part of it. But eventually I want to refinance based on the model I'm used to of getting it up, raising the NOI, and then refinancing based on a commercial cap rate. Does that work where you can say, okay, we've got the income and the expenses, you know, we've changed it and now it's worth a lot more. Um, does that work in this model? Well, it sounds to me like you have asked what I would call a panel discussion question. And what happens is we've got uh, Vern and Janet both on board because you are raising questions of uh, the real estate finance aspect of it and the how to market this facility question. So how about we start with Vern? I'll play the MC on this one. We start with Vern and then uh, transfer it over to Janet. So if it's a large facility, then cap rate does start to take some uh, precedence. Um, while I see these occasionally um, valued on cap rate, it's rare that I see a small facility sell on cap rate. Uh, there are some numbers that kick in that kind of, we try to use as a comparison, but if I'm doing evaluation, I'm gonna look at it at from four different angles and cap rate is just one of them. Um, so it, it, if it's a large facility though, if you're looking at 50 or hundred beds, then there's a lot more out there that's comparable and, and we can look at cap rates and say, okay, it's gonna be in this range because there's more comps that are, uh, we can measure against, but small facilities, okay, they, but Go ahead. Well, let me let me qualify that. It's a large physical house that is licensed for eight, but it's a very, very nice large house. And so does that start to qualify? Because it's in a residential neighborhood, it's a house. Does I mean it's so it's not a large facility, but it is a large house that can uh, get a large per bed rate. So, so would um, that be a cap rate situation? No, it, I, I'd say an eight bed would probably not be a cap rate situation. We would look, when I look at that, I'm gonna look at, again, four different methods and then weight each of the uh, methods. And then the last thing is I wanna look at the financing and see if it would even be bankable. Um, because if everything else is in order and it's still not bankable, then it just doesn't make sense. You're, you're never, never going to get a loan against it if it's not bankable, no matter what everything else looks like. So um, that's one of the factors that is the real test is, would the bank lend on this? And there I'm looking we, at DSCR. Before we move on to Janet or have any further on that, let me just share with you guys in case you want to see that blog I was talking about. All you need to do is point your camera phone at this and it'll take you to the blog that's got these seven points. Um, and you can do that while Vern and Janet continue to talk about this. All right, sorry to interrupt you, Vern. No worries. That's okay. I was remiss in the question. I was checking the chat. So was the um, question, refresh me on what the question was. So, so our Colorado Springs lady, as uh, and I, that's how I shall refer to you since you got your 719 showing and not a name, uh, was asking about um, the financing of a house that's currently uh, got a low occupancy. 
and um, and it seemed that she was opening the door to the question about you know what do I do about this? Um, is that a fair, if very brief, summary of what you were getting at? Colorado Springs. I'm basically trying to see. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You're on mute now. Uh oh. Yeah. One nine, you're on mute. Okay, there I am. Okay, so yeah, so I'm trying to figure this out because I'm 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 basically um, looking at something right now, and it's a very big house, and I think it's maybe or maybe not going to appraise for what he's asking. But if I'm looking at this from a cap rate standpoint, because it's very low occupancy. I think uh, from my what I'm used to is I can get the occupancy up and suddenly it's worth a lot more. So I'm trying to figure out if my theory is true or not. You know, even if the house doesn't appraise where I think it will, um, I think when I look at the bottom line financials, it makes sense of the number I'm going to offer. So I guess I'm trying to see if there's if I'm thinking this through correctly, because this model's a little bit different than I'm used to. Yeah. Well, the national idea is to do a five mile radius around the home to see if there's natural barriers, because I did, I worked my butt off trying to make a home work in an affluent area in Denver, but it backed up to Cherry Creek Dam, which is a natural barrier. It also, on, on the other side is I-25, so we had a natural barrier. We did not have a five mile radius around that home to pull from for, for, for affluent families who could pay for that home. Um, it, that home never made it. As much as I marketed it, it never made it because it didn't have a five mile circle around it to say, okay, here's our area of, of where we can pull our clients from because the competition here in Denver is so intense. Families won't drive you know, 20 miles to see their mom. They might drive five miles if your home is awesome, but you've got to have a five mile radius around that home that can pull in clients into the affluent neighborhood that you think you're, you know, you bought an awesome house. Um, so do you have an affluent neighborhood and what's the demographics in that neighborhood? If you're living in, an, if your home is a neighborhood that's all children with a swimming pool, uh, well, you're limited a little bit um, but look at the five mile radius around that to see if you have natural barriers and what your marketing opportunities around that home. And that'll tell you if you can pull it out of the hole there. I'll add one more yeah, thing. I, I, um, go ahead. And I'm sorry, what's your name? Linda. Linda. Um, Linda, I believe I'm familiar with that house that you're talking about. It sure rings a bell. And I'd be willing to chat with you uh, maybe tomorrow about that and kind of help you noodle through this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I mean, what I'm trying to, I, I think that there's uh, opportunity there, but I'm trying to figure out how you value it when you get it up to that point. Is it only that you're raising the business income or is it like an apartment where you're raising everything so everything's just worth more? Yeah, it's it's not quite like an apartment. It, I wish it was. You know, I love the way that the commercial world works with real estate, and uh, you know, <laughs> that's a really sweet area. But it doesn't quite work that way with the assisted yeah, living. Yeah. It, it's too real estate and, and too operationally you, intensive. Your occupancy is down, either lack of marketing or poor care standards. That's usually. I don't know. That's my experience as an operator, not a, an investor, but you either got poor marketing or poor care, care standards for your residents. The way I like thought about looking at it is, you know, you have the, the residential real estate itself and, and like that has a value that you can probably get a close approximation to. And then, you know, if you're looking at that, the value. So if like uh, they said, Oh, this, you know, I'll sell the, the business and the real estate for $3 million and, you know, you get an appraiser out there and like the real estate appraises for, for 2 million. Now you look at, okay, they're asking three. So they're putting a million dollar value on the business and, you know, that's a, 
you can look at the the business value on like a cap rate basis or like I, I kind of like look at it as like on an EBITDA multiple basis to so look at like the net operating income to the value of the business. And then you have to say like, does that make sense? Um, there's one that I had under contract that was for 2.2 and then the real estate like appraised for 1 point or actually no, the real estate appraised for 2 million. So that put like the business value at like 200,000 and it was putting off like net operating income of, a hundred thousand. So, you know, you look at like where you can get the, the value and that's kind of like the two part approach, right? Looking at the real estate, looking at the business and like coming up with a value and then comparing that to what they're asking for. Good points, Chris. That is certainly one of the ways that I use in my valuations. Um, and, and then there's three other things that we look at just because there's, it, it's all across the board in this space. There's no one right way to do it. So we have to kind of take all the ways that we can do it and, and then kind of weight it. And it, it, it's, it's a little bit of an art and a little bit of a science and a little bit of a guess. <laughs> but I've been pretty close. I'm almost wondering if anyone's done this before. It's probably more relevant in Texas with like a high property tax, but um, you know, have you negotiated the purchase price to allocate more towards um, the business than, um, uh, than the real estate in order to keep like your reassessment value lower? Uh, on the contrary, we see most sellers want to put more into the real estate side because then they can 1031 it and you can't 1031 a business so you know they quit doing that i think it was back in 14 or 15 so there's you know i That's understand that the, the buyer may want to do it that way yeah <laughs> and then they actually have a little bit more of a depreciation schedule but the seller is going to want as much as possible the best way is to get the accountants involved and let the accountants figure out what that number is. And then you can always point to the accountant when the IRS comes knocking, hey, we had a professional <laughs> look at it. This was their value. And that's why we put that on there. All right. Vern, I think it uh, might be time to kind of wrap up my part of the show. All right. So um, we do have one more section coming up and this is a haves and wants. This is just an opportunity for anybody to um, present any uh, services they may have for the industry, or if you're looking for partners, this is a way to reach out to everybody and tell them what you're working on and see if anybody uh, wants to do that. And then we leave this forum open until everybody's gone. So if you wanna stay and network, again, this is a networking opportunity and we leave the, the everything open until the last one's gone and then I come in and turn off everything. So you can hang out and just network with people after the meeting. We've seen that go on for another 30, 40 minutes. And you're more than welcome to do that. It's, uh, it's just another I, I don't know how to. I don't know how to scan. I want to buy the book. Oh, it, it's, not, it's not a book, Catherine. All you need to do is point your camera at that. But uh, um, uh, if you go to my email address, uh, I can I can and send me an email and I put my email address in the link in the chat, then I will send okay. you the link, okay, the thank link you. to the article. Okay. Okay. Very thank good. you. Thank you. Yeah. Vern, thank I want to awesome presentation for anybody interested in investing. I think it's an awesome opportunity. Um, I think group home living is the way of the future, but you know, that's my personal opinion, but thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Brian did an excellent job. Let's give him a round of applause. Oh, thank you very much, everybody. And I uh, look forward to talking with you guys again another time. And uh, you all have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Um, uh, again, this is an opportunity for you to put your information into the chat screen. And you'll notice where you type your message. There's a little button with three dots. If you click on that button with the three dots, it says save chat. And it will save it as a text file for you. So uh, feel free to do that so you can reach out to everybody. Uh, does anybody have any haves or wants that they want to share with the group? 
Wes, are you raising your hand? You're muted. Yes. <clears throat> I'm basically looking uh, to interview owners. I'm working with Dr. DeBrincat. He is debuting new technology. Now he's debuting it in sports uh, practitioners and uh, fitness centers, but it'll also work in assisted living if the people are open-minded enough. And uh, first off, there's a camera uh, that completely records the capillary system. It allows the doctor to see inside the, the person and see where all the different things are going wrong. All disease starts in the capillary system. And uh, we have 125 hospitals using it and it's now gonna be available to any practitioner. And I would we work with your doctor that works with your, and we'd work with that. The second part is there's a nutraceutical, a capsule that people take and it actually reverses the damage in the capillary system. And the one thing I don't know in assisted living, you definitely put putting yourself apart, people would actually get better. In fact, the Kidney Foundation of uh, the Dutch has done a four year double blind study on this, on renal failure and it reversed it. And there's a lot of other studies going on in 125 hospitals. But again, I don't know if it's good for this industry because uh, it's so unique and different. And you would be talking to the family on whether their um, resident wanted to have it. I have, my, I'm the first one in chat there's a 20 minute video where Dr. DeBrincat explains this and how um, the capillary system is what keeps all the organs uh, from failing. As the capillary system fails, all the organs start starving. So if you're interested in talking to me, I'd love to, and we'll see if this industry is right for it, but your people would actually get well, much uh, better than they are now. It's been proven in many studies. And again, I have the contact information, the first one in chat. Thanks, Les. Jessica, did you have something you want to share with the group? The, um, so I'm also in Colorado Springs and Vern, you and I have talked about kind of facility that I'm kind of looking at right now, but the, um, it's, it's um, possibly just looking at purchasing the, the real estate and I don't know, seeing if anybody was interested in possibly running a facility or wanting to come and, and open a facility in the, in the, you know, in that property itself. Um, anyway, it's all set up like ready for an assisted living facility. So um, yeah, right. I gotta make that offer or whatever. I'm sorry. Good, good. I, um, you may want to chat with Catherine. I know her and I have had some conversation and she's down in that area too. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Vern, you can give Vern, you can give him my number because uh, I, I I didn't have a chance to uh to type. Oh, okay. All right. So yeah, just you, if you want to reach give him, out. Give him my, yeah. Yeah, oh. you can give him my number and yeah. then uh you, uh you can call me uh, to see that how we can do that, uh, it, you know. Thank Perfect. you, because yeah. now I'm start driving. Can't do anything. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to talk about a service they offer or something? Kelvin. Hi, my name is Kelvin. Uh, a couple of years ago, I tried to open a 16 bed. A uh, home in uh, right outside of Castle Rock, and among other mistakes I made, I ran out of money, and I lost a lot of money. But if I'd have found the guy that I now work for six months sooner, I could have had my home open. Uh, we do bridge loans and some hard money loans. When you're in a tough position, uh, we can make it happen. That obviously makes us a little more expensive. And so you want to go with other routes, you know, Vern's deal that he does. And there's, you know, if you can do SBA, do it because that's the best way to do it. But if you're stuck, we can help you. And uh, my information is in the chat or send me a quick message here on the chat and love to talk to you and just share what we can do and see if it might fit for you. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Janice? Hey, Vern? Vern? Yes, Catherine. So, 
so I, I still don't understand. So, so, so my understanding you are uh, is another kind of F F SBA, correct? No, our lease option program um, that we do. And if you went to the website, Rao Lease Options, and I'll put that in the chat um, just so that you have access to that. Driving. Okay, well, you can contact me and I can send you the link to that. Okay, or you can email me or whatever. Okay, or I can call you for that okay. option. Janet? All right, I'd be happy to help anybody with their operations. Um, I've been doing this for like 19 years, um, ran eight homes at one time in the hot seat plenty of times, eight, 80, 80 surveys with the State Hill Department. So I'd be happy to walk you through if you're buying the real estate that's burn steel, if you're buying the operations, I'd be happy to walk you through, you know, are you, are you is it compliant or they, you know, I could spend 45 minutes walking the floor and tell you, telling you immediately, you know, are you walking into a disaster in Colorado? <laughs> As I've been on the board with the State Hill Department rewriting the regs, I've been with Cala. And I, I enjoy doing that because we need to up the standard in Colorado for, for assisted living group homes. We don't want to run disasters. We want, want to run awesome group homes and set the standard that group homes are a viable option for seniors. Because in COVID, we, we fared better than the big facilities. We naturally cohorted in seven, eight, 10 people. So. You know, I'll be happy to watch the floor to tell you how your operations are. I highly recommend her. Hey, Janet, this is Fran. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I heard from a friend that, um, I don't know if you have the answers, but I heard from a friend that um, I think state is coming up with the new regulations July 1st that every assisted living home, whether big or small, they should have bathrooms. Each room has bathrooms. Is that something that is really that we should watch out for? You know, the, the new regs got adopted July, uh, June 14th, and they're on the CDPHE website. And uh, so you have to, right now, you have to have one full bathroom for every six residents. A full bathroom is a sink, a toilet, a shower, or a tub. So that's regulation as of June 14th of this year. So that's that's what we heard. Um, is it in the works to do that? No, um, not that I know of. And, and the regulations of Colorado have to go before the Board of Health. So it, it will be a process to get that changed. So right now it's one full bathroom for every six residents. That makes sense, but I, I kind of like ran into this old friend of mine and he told me that um that due to new regs, like every assisted living home, whether small or big, I think they're gonna waiver it for now, but give you about a year, about a year to get bathrooms into every bedrooms. And I'm like, that's impossible. Yeah. You know what, that could be a Medicaid reg, but check with your state health department. I mean, CDPHE has the regs out there. So um, it's a, right now it's a full bathroom for every six residents. And I believe what Fran's referring to is the FGI guidelines that came out a few years ago and the scare that we had with that where they were saying basically that, but there are, uh, there are exceptions in Colorado for the smaller facilities. So they don't have to, abide by that particular regulation. Yeah. So, and a, a lot of that is thanks to Michelle Pinkowski, who really went to bat for our groups and uh, helped curb that. And she's actually on the FGI panel now nationally, which is a big, big help for the uh, small assisted living. Okay, any more um, haves and wants? If not, then I'm going to leave this open for uh, general networking. Uh, Al, did you have something you wanted to contribute? Okay. Well, thanks everybody for showing up tonight. It, it, we had a, a great group and uh, feel free to hang out and just network with yourselves. Um, again, I'm going to remind you to put your information into the chat and that way you can reach out to the people that you met tonight. And uh, 
with all that said, I bid you adieu and we will see you next month. Thank you, Vern. Always. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Hey Janet. Hey, how are you? Hey Janet. Yeah. Oh Janet, if you are the if you are the night owl, uh, if you want to call me tonight, you can call me tonight. If it's not, I will call you 